think there's a recording. Um, so good morning, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are, and welcome to this presentation. Um, basically, uh, what I'm going to be talking here um, is a workshop on on data stacks, and um, you know uh, what I'm here to talk about is like a cloud native uh, workshop, and um, uh, you know we run this uh, pretty much every week, um, and we do this for two hours. So in the next like 30 minutes. Uh, it's going to be um, uh, kind of an overview, a very quick overview, and, and I'll point you at a number of resources, um, which is uh, good enough for you to get started. Okay. With that said, let me go to the presentation. And let me see. Give me a second on this. Should be able to get this going. Okay. So, so what I'm here to talk about is a modern cloud data, uh, data platform. Um, and the agenda for the rest of the few, few minutes is, um, you know, an intro. Uh, I talk briefly about NoSQL and Cassandra, and then talk about Cassandra, which is our Kubernetes version of Cassandra. And then I'll talk about multi-cluster and cloud, which is where really Cassandra shines. If you think about Cassandra, it was there even before the cloud was there. Right. And and, um, you know, that's what made it, um, you know, um, interesting. So um, so what we'll see is how, um, you know, um, uh, Cassandra has kind of adapted to the cloud and also adapted to a multi cloud. Um, just want to make sure that I'm uh, I'm good to go and I'll just make sure that Slack. So that I, I'm making sure that I'm recording on Hopin. All right. So let's keep going and let's see what I, um, you know, hopefully that I'm I'm doing everything right here and. Uh, my name is Raghavan Srinivas. You can just go by Rags, and I'm a developer advocate and um, you know architect at uh, at uh, um, DataStax. And uh, you know, essentially, I'm uh, from the Java side of the world. I do a lot in Kubernetes. Uh, one of my passions is distributed systems, and I really love to teach and communicate. Um, we have a whole group, and I keep mentioning this that uh, you know we live in a golden age of developers. A um, lot of resources, a lot of free resources, and I'll, I'll point to all of them uh, in a second. So going back to NoSQL, it was a meetup um, that happened in June 11, 20, 2009, which is really like 13 years ago. And they wanted a catchy hashtag to, you know, to be able to um, come up with something that really was not SQL. And that's where NoSQL came into the picture, right? <laughs> kind of cool. Um, so the, if you look at relational versus NoSQL, the idea is that um, you know relational is about a standard relational data model. You know, um, you, you you would have heard of the different normal forms and so on. It's really about asset transactions, uh, whereas NoSQL, on the other hand, is really more about what we call as the cattle, meaning that you know you have commodity hardware and you are going to be able to spread your data across multiple of these rather than one of those which you know, grows and grows and grows until at some point it's going to fall off, right? Um, so, so it's really about what you. I mean, the, the key part of this is to be able to distribute your data in some form, and that's kind of sometimes referred to as sharding. And we'll talk about why sharding is good and bad, right? You know, you have to do some sharding, uh, but typically what you do is you don't let friends shard because it's hard. Um, we know in de in in um, development that you know it's not you you won't get everything for free right so when it comes to distributed systems there is a uh, brewer's uh, conjecture that was enunciated by brewer uh, which is also referred to as the cap theorem and essentially what it does is it talks about consistency availability and partition tolerance and in a case of a failure scenario what happens is you'll have to sacrifice one of these you can only pick two of these right so one of these has to go Actually, it turns out partition tolerance is more important than consistency because consistency you can sometimes live with because eventually you know things become consistent. But partition tolerance actually creates uh, inconsistency issues that you know anybody, including my grandmother, can figure out that that's something wrong, right? So it's probably uh, 
Um, so what Cass Cassandra does is it, it takes partition tolerance into consideration for sure. And then sometimes you can tune the consistency or it may not be available at certain times, right? Because what the captain and thesis says is you have to pick two of the three. You cannot have all the three in a failure scenario. Uh, it's really a master peer, peer uh, masterless peer-to-peer -peer architecture. There's no single point of failure and scales for writes and reads. Um, like I said, you have to do some sharding. This oversimplified way of looking at Cassandra is that it's it's kind of like a um, um, you know distributed hash table. Uh, you know the the uh, data is placed in different nodes based on a hashing algorithm, but you know the platform itself adapts you know to dynamic changes in the infrastructure. Uh, it distributes the keys appropriately and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, it is configurably consistent. You know, you can you can you, you can look into this um, you know a little bit more. But but some of the biggest um, companies really use uh, Apache Cassandra, and they keep you know keep on going. So um, Kate Sandra, which is really about running uh, your Cassandra and Kubernetes, uh, this is from one of a former skeptic um, who figured that you know Kubernetes were not, not a good match for data because it was really about you know, stateless apps initially anyway. Uh, but, you know, Kubernetes has, uh, has moved on, um, has adapted, you know, and and I think, um, you know, he, uh, Christopher Batford now actually works for Cassandra, which is saying that, you know, Kubernetes is prime for, um, uh, you know, data. And that's what we call as Kate Sandra, which really can be installed on anything uh, you know, any piece of uh, infrastructure that you want, like Kind, Minikube, K3D, which is really more of kind of a, a testing development scenario. And then on a production scenario, you maybe want to install it on GKE, AKS, AKS, and so on. Okay. Um, this is Cassandra. It goes into different components. I'm not going to uh, talk too much about that here. But the installation is very straightforward. You just do this Helm repo add. And there are several workshops which kind of go through that. One of the cool things about Kate Sandra is that it's also multi-cluster cloud. And we recently introduced something called as a Kate Sandra operator, which makes it very easy. We push the hound to the limit and then build this operator called the Kate Sandra operator, which is really about multi-cluster. Kate Sandra operator, if you want to think about it, is an easy way of kind of installing Cassandra on multiple clusters. Uh, the CAS operator, which also is leveraged by the Kate Sandra operator, installs Cassandra on the respective clusters, but then the Kate Sandra operator kind of makes it a multi-cluster as well. Uh, so the idea is that, you know, make it very easy to install on multiple clusters. So with that said, I know this is a workshop, so let's do some digging in, and then I'll follow it up with resources, OK? So very straightforward. All that we do, and, and maybe I should provide the link right here, is um, you know go to github.com slash datastacksdevs, which is really what we're going to do here. Um, you know, I've gone there. Uh, let me actually go back to there. OK, and there are a whole bunch of uh, you know workshops in here. Like, for example, if you're interested in Stargate, which is our unifying API, you can do that. Uh, if you want to look at uh, introduction to NoSQL, this is probably the best way to get started. And all that I do is essentially, um, you know, I follow along uh, with this exercise. OK, so I create an AstroDB. OK, I've already created this AstroDB, but uh, let me go in and, and see if it's still there and running and all that, right? So. So let me open this link in a new uh, tab. OK. And this is the Rastra. OK. And I'm going to kind of do a brief tour of this. And, and you can do all this yourself, which is why, um, you know, even though you cannot do it possibly in the next 40 minutes, you should be able to do it at, you know, at some point at your leisure. OK. So let me sign in. OK. Remember me and sign in. You may be asked some few questions, you know, if you're doing this for the first time. But, you know, it's pretty cool because it, it doesn't require a credit card. And with $25 of credit per month, you know, which is what you get here, right, uh, you can do some pretty um, um, you know, sophisticated things, including running a fairly sophisticated production workflow. I have a number of different databases, and each of these databases has something called as key space. Okay, and if I go back to my GitHub, uh, my workshop, you can see here I have to create a database name called uh, workshops and a key space name called no, no SQL one. Okay, so um, the first time around when you're creating this, it may come into pending or initializing on the dashboard. 
Uh, just wait for a few seconds and it should be up and running. I've already created this. So, um, you know, you can see here, I have a uh, uh, database called workshops and a bunch of other databases as well. And then I have a bunch of key spaces, to-do list, to-dos, uh, and so on and so forth, okay? So now that I've um, gone into Astra, let's go and look in um, how to create the next steps, right? You know, just, just follow along here, okay? And then it talks about how you can click on the database, right? And then click on the SQL console. Uh, SQL is what we call as the Cassandra query language, okay? So let's go in and click on that, all right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on workshops, right? And then I'm going to click on SQL console, okay? So this is the Cassandra query language that I was talking about, right? So let me click on that. And just follow along, right? Uh, which is the nice part about this workshop. It, it lets you get your hands dirty. And that's the only way, you know, we believe that, you know, uh, developers learn, right? You know, by learning by learning by doing. So, so let's look at uh, well, um, the next steps. So describe the key spaces, right? So let's go ahead and describe it. So all that I do is really cut and paste from there, right? So you can see here there are a bunch of uh, key spaces. And you can see here there's a to-do list, um, a whole bunch of workshops that talk about a to-do app, how you can connect a front end to back end, and, and so on and so forth, OK? So there are, there are a whole bunch of uh, um, you know, things that you can try out there, okay? Um, then there is better reads um, and and so on, okay? So let's follow along. Let's go go ahead and do the next next step, right? Um, so use NoSQL 1, right? So we'll, let's do that. And uh, use NoSQL 1. This is basically a key space, which is really a logical place to create your tables. So that's really what it is. Um, nothing fancy, okay? So, so once you do this, then you create all your tables in here. So I've already created this table, but let me do this anyway, okay? And uh, I create a table, okay? Then I go back, all right? And again, describe the key space. Now you should see the table, okay? And create uh, key space NoSQL with replication and so on. And then you can um, insert these videos, which I've done all of this. And let's go straight into this and select star from videos, OK? So this probably not a good idea to do select star because what, you know, remember about sharding that I talked about, um, you know, the data is distributed on different uh, nodes. If you do a select star, then essentially it's going to each of those nodes. So, so it's a better idea to actually use the partition key to be able to, um, um, you know, use these queries. But, but since we don't have a whole lot of data here, you can see all the um, you know, the data uh, that is in, in videos, OK? All right. So now, um, um, where do you go? All right. So if I go back to, um, you know, let's give me a second on this. I lost. OK. So this is where it is. So now what I can do is, um, okay, let me actually use this. I know that I tried it somewhere else, but, but let me go back here and let's do this here, okay. And I have this workshop running here anyway. So, so let me go back. And we'll go back to select start from videos again, OK? Uh, and again, you know, at any point, if you're lost, you can just start from, from scratch, OK? So let's select start from videos. OK, do the same thing here, right? So I'm going to go back um, and look at workshops. Go to my SQL console. Okay. And do the select start from videos. Okay, actually I need to use no SQL one. Right? And then I do the select start from videos. Okay, and there there are all my videos. Okay. So with that said, uh, 
then you can do you know a you know, key based uh, kind of query, right? So I can do my key based query. So here, what I'm doing is select start from videos. Okay, and you'll see here that you know I'm um, getting only that particular um, where video ID is E4, whatever, right? So so all of that. Um, can be, um, you know, you can kind of go go through this. You can create uh, users by city and so on. Uh, it also understands JSON. So let's look at this from a JSON perspective where uh, we insert this from a JSON or we can just, you know, query all of this from a uh, JSON perspective. So so let's look at this. Um, same, data, same data, uh, but JSON, right? So, so you can see here, this is all JSON, okay? All right, so that, to be able to access the REST API, you have to be able to create an application token. It walks through how to create an application token. I've already created an application token, OK? And uh, you know, typically, what I do is I put it here. So I just copy my application token, because that is required to be able to invoke any of the REST APIs. So once you get this, then what you do is you go to this uh, Swagger, right? And you can launch the Swagger UI. It shows how to do that. So all that I'm going to do is, again, try to connect. And somewhere here, there should be a swagger, right? And I'm going to try to open the link in a new tab. OK, so now we have the REST APIs for, for uh, um, um, you know, for this particular database and, and key space and so on. So, so let's start looking at, you know, one of these uh, APIs. Let's, let's give it a try. There. OK, so let me put in the token. OK, so because that's required. Um, and for the namespace, uh, you put NoSQL 1, right? And let's execute this and see what happens. So it'll, it'll come back with, you know, this This is a uh, what are the data available? Um, and you got a 200 code or something, right? So for example, if I just do this rags NS, right? Uh, I'm probably going to get a, uh, a 401, right? You know, which is like uh, our, uh, an Intel server or something like that. Let's see what happens. You know, you should probably get a different code here, right? It's not from 404, right? Okay, so you do get a 404. And let's say if I, uh, um, let's put this properly back, no SQL 1, right? And if I'm uh, using this and execute this, then I should probably get an un unauthorized because um, I didn't put the um, uh, token correctly, right? So let me put the token back, right? And I can play around with this. There are a whole bunch of things that I can try uh, like get all the namespaces. So let's take a look at this, right? So try it out. Again, all that I need in this particular case is just the token, right? And if I just execute it, I should be able to get the same information that I got before, right? Uh, you know, it has the to-dos, the to-do list, uh, the Draptesca, which is Spider in Italian, native Java, NoSQL 1, which is what we are looking at, better reads, and so on and so forth, OK? Um, so so that kind of illustrates how you use the REST API, right? But but Developers come in different shapes and sizes, right? You know, uh, I want to use gRPC API, or I want to use Document API, or I want to use GraphQL API. Uh, no problem. You know, we provide all of those, and all that you need to do is, um, you know, kind of um, use those uh, uh, APIs. So all of these are provided in Stargate. Um, so let's look at a example of creating a table uh, with a GraphQL. Uh, okay, so. So what you're going to do is you're going to connect to GraphQL, okay? And to be able to do that, let's take a look at that again. Connect, right? And you can see the GraphQL API here, okay? And you can open the GraphQL Playground, okay? And I'm going to open the link in the new tab. Again, this is my GraphQL Playground. I can get rid of the old one. Okay, let's go back here. And before you do anything, right, you have to populate the uh, the token. So let me go ahead and do that. Make sure that I'm getting it right, right? And uh, let's just run it. Let's see what happens, right? So you can see exactly the same thing here as well. Um, you know, so we saw how we did this in REST, how we did this in SQL, and how we are now doing this in in, uh, in GraphQL, right? So there are two concepts. One is a schema, and the other is the GraphQL itself, where you apply some of the mutations, where you do the CRUD-based operations, which is the create, read, update, delete. Uh, whereas if you're updating the schema, then you use the GraphQL um, schema endpoint. 
And again, you know, all that I need to do is kind of walk through this example, right? So in this, um, you know, we create a, uh, so one, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a, uh, uh, a table, okay? So um, create table, you specify the key space name, you specify the table name, uh, and, and so on, okay? So what I'm going to do is, since I've already created this one, I'm going to create a, a little bit different one. OK, so go back into my, since I'm still doing the uh, schema, right, I'm going to create a new table, OK, and I'm going to call it uh, yeah, key value new, OK, very fancy, right? And all that I need to do is hit this, and let's see what happens. OK, you can see here that this particular um, thing got created, OK? So, so it got created, and I'm good to go, OK? So now, if you go back and look at, uh, I hit play and so on and so forth. And you, if you go to um, SQL console, you can kind of look at this uh, table as well. So how do we populate the table? The populate the table, you have to switch to the GraphQL tab. Okay, not the GraphQL schema, but the GraphQL tab. Okay, and again, the first thing we're going to do is make sure the HTTP headers are set up right. So now I need to make sure I have my Astra token. OK, and update this. And let's make sure I have everything. OK. And then you can see, again, you know, all that I'm doing is following this. OK, it says, instead of API GraphQL NoSQL 1, um, it should end with something like this, right? Because what happens is the endpoint is going to be a different one. So, so let's go back here into work uh, into workshop and and fix this, right? So it's API. So we're not looking at um, GraphQL anymore, but we are looking at this, right? The no no SQL one. All right. So now that we've done that. Uh, I think we're ready to um, populate the data, right? So um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this query, OK? And we're going to paste it here, right? Let's see what happens. There you go. It inserted these two, key one and key two. Um, and it showed how you could use the GraphQL um, schema, okay, which is kind of cool, right? Um, so, so we saw the REST, uh, and we saw Document, and we saw Swagger, right? Um, you know, which is REST. Uh, we saw Document. You can do Graph databases as well. Um, like I said, there are a whole bunch of examples that you can follow, um, but I don't think we have too much time here. I need to wrap up here, so let's start looking at the presentation. OK, and uh, wrap this up. OK. OK, so this is the, this is the uh, link that you're going to get started, github.com slash datastacksdes, um, whole bunch of uh, uh, things in there. Um, we have a AstroDB build-a-thon going on with real prices, but ending very, very shortly. You know, you have about 20 days to make up for lost ground, but you still have a lot of money out there. You know, if you can register a build uh, hackathon, I think most of them have given out, but but there is still the last round of challenge that I think uh, you can enter. Um, if you want more information other than what's in the work, you know, attend our workshops, uh, but also feel free to jump on our Discord. Uh, where you can get a lot more information as well. Uh, and do subscribe to our uh, YouTube. Uh, you have all kinds of uh, workshops in there. And most of these are hands-on. Um, you know, In fact, all of them, I think, are hands-on uh, on different, different, different topics. Um, uh, you know, of course, obviously, you know, it will involve something about cloud native programming. Um, but, you know, we recently had like an e-commerce um, workshop that concluded uh, before that, uh, you know, the early part of uh, this year, we had a boot camp, uh, you know, essentially about microservices. So, so all of them are available for you. And one of the cool things we do is we also provide badges. Uh, a lot of people love these badges. They put it on LinkedIn. 
um, and and it does pretty well. So so take a look at these badges as well. Um, all that you need to do is we you have to submit a homework after your workshop, and we do grade them. Okay, and so, so seriously, we take this seriously. You can grade them, and and you can you can put these on your uh, LinkedIn or wherever you want to do. Uh, with that said, thank you very much. And uh, I know there was a little bit of uh, hiccups in the beginning, but but I was glad to be able to get through the uh, entire material. Uh, I want to thank everybody for attending and see you some part of the world sometime. Ciao.